This is a continuation of this segment dealing with prophetic time measurements. In Grattan Guinness's book History Unveiling Prophecy, we read the following. Piraeus, in his commentary on the Apocalypse, AD 1643, boldly reckons the 1,260 years of papal dominion from the decree of focus in 606. His work represents the substance of lectures delivered in the year 1608 to the Academy of Heidelberg over which he presided. Boniface III, he says, was exalted by a decree of focus to, quote, the chair of universal pestilence, end quote, in 606. Quote, from the year of Christ, therefore, 606, until this time the holy city hath been trodden underfoot by the Roman Gentiles, which is the space of 1,037 years, and is to be trodden down 223 years more, to wit, until the year of Christ, 1866, End quote. Guinness goes on, a bold prediction based on the prophetic times. There is no hesitation about the language. From his chair at Heidelberg in the 17th century, Piraeus looked forward 223 years into the future and guided by the sure word of prophecy, pointed out the year 1866 as that which would witness the overthrow of papal dominion. And history in the events of 1866-70 to 70 justified his anticipation. Seven years later, in 1650, Holland, in his work on the Apocalypse, says that according to prophecy, quote, there remain 216 years more, end quote, for the papal power, which calculation also places the termination of the 1,260 years in 1866. Grattan Guinness continues, In the year 1746, Dr. Gill, in his well-known voluminous commentary, similarly placed the ending of the 1,260 years in 1866. The beginning of the Pope's reign, he says, was in the year 606. Quote, If to this we were to add 1,260, the expiration of his reign will fall in the year 1866, so that he may have upwards of 120 years yet to continue, but of this, end quote, he adds, quote, we cannot be certain, however, the conjecture is not improbable, end quote. Reader, in his apocalyptic commentary, A.D. 1778, placed the 1,260 years in the interval A.D. 606 to 1866. Twenty-four years later, Galloway, at the commencement of the 19th century, in 1802, also points to 1866 as the termination of the 1,260 years of papal dominion. So did Faber in 1805, Freer in 1816, Holmes in 1819, Bickersteth in 1823, Irving in 1828 and Eliot in 1844. Berda in 1849 says, quote, the year 606 appears to me to be the grand and momentous date from which it is most satisfactory to compute the 1,260 years of the papal antichrist. If this be agreed, then the eventual termination of his reign will be in the year 1866, and we are now approaching a period most momentous to the church and to the world." End quote. John Gill, in his Exposition of the Entire Bible, 1746, says this, Hence it appears that 1,260 prophetic days, that is, years, contain the whole period of Antichrist's reign and continuance, so that could we tell where they began, it might be exactly known when his reign will end. But for want of knowing the former, the best calculators have failed in the latter, but seeing the time when he was made universal bishop by focus bids fair for the time of his open appearance and the beginning of his reign and of his blasphemy, which was in the year 606, to which, if we add 1,260, the expiration of his reign will fall in the year 1866, so that he may have upwards of 120 years yet to continue, but of this we cannot be certain, however, the conjecture is not improbable. Robert Fleming, writing in 1701, well before the conclusion of any of the dates, made some remarkable calculations. He believes that the years would probably be calendar or prophetic years of 360 days, which are of course shorter than solar years as we have previously discussed, 
And so Fleming arrives at 1848. Well, 1848 did in fact see another major revolution in Europe in which the Pope was forced to flee Rome, so Fleming was correct with his approach. The Pope that fled was the same Pope Pius IX who reigned in 1870 and saw the loss of temporal power after declaring the dogma of papal, inf of papal infallibility. Fleming says the following, Therefore, we may justly reckon that the papal head took its first rise from the remarkable year 606, when Focus did in manner devolve the government of the West upon him by giving him the title of universal bishop. From which period, if we date the 1260 years, they lead us down, as I have said already, to the year 1866, which is 1848, according to the prophetical calculation, or if a bare title of this sort be not thought sufficient to constitute the Pope head of the beast, we may reckon this two years later, viz. from the year 1608, when Boniface IV did first publicly authorise idolatry by dedicating the Pantheon to the worship of the Virgin Mary and all the saints. Here, almost a century before the event, Robert Fleming points to the era of 1794 as the beginning of the judgment on the papacy and carrying through to 1848. The French and European revolutions, including the wars of Napoleon, right throughout this period and particularly occurring during these actual years, were a major destructive blow to Catholic Europe and the papacy. The fifth vial, which Robert refers to here, was indeed poured out during this era and on to 1870. He was correct in believing that this period would consume, but not destroy the papacy. So we read this, the fifth vial, Revelation 16 verses 10 to 11, which is to be poured out on the seat of the beast or the dominions that more immediately belong to and depend upon the Roman see, that, I say, this judgment will probably begin about the year 1794 and expire about the year 1848, so that the duration of it, upon this supposition, will be the space of 54 years, for I do suppose that seeing the Pope receive the title of Supreme Bishop no sooner than the year 606, he cannot be supposed to have any vial poured out upon his seat immediately, so as to ruin his authority, so signally as this judgment must be supposed to do, until the year 1848, which is the date of the 1260 years in prophetical account, when they are reckoned from the year 606. But yet we are not to imagine that this fire will totally destroy the papacy, though it will exceedingly weaken it. For we find this still in being and alive when the next vial is poured out. The sixth vial, Revelation 16, verse 12, etc., will be poured out upon the Mohammedan Antichrist as the former was, and so on and so on. The insight that these historicists had so long ago is truly remarkable. It is of the Spirit of God. Yet, in what great university or seminary of the last one or two hundred years are these things to be found? They're not there. Instead, the places of learning, the seminaries and so on, are filled with rationalism, futurism, preterism or idealism. Isaiah 59 verse 14 tells us that truth is fallen in the street. The church house today is filled with so-called prophecy experts who are regurgitating the doctrines of Rome or of the German rationalists. In Robert Carangola's book, The Present Reign of Jesus Christ, he talks about the prophecies, uh, the predictions made by Robert Fleming, which we've just looked at, and he says this, An example of the power of true apocalyptic interpretation is seen in the works of Robert Fleming, who was invited before the English court of William of Orange, King William III, to lecture on Bible prophecy. It was approximately 1690. The king asked when the papacy would fall from its temporal power in Europe. Fleming not only instructed the king, but in 1701 also published his understanding in a book called Apocalyptic Key, which is what we've just looked at previously. Robert uh, Carangola continues, Almost a hundred years before its fulfilment, Fleming understood that the question encompassed the events of the fifth vial in the book of Revelation, and so on.
The prophecy experts that are instructing the President of America today are schooled mainly in the Roman Catholic Futurist teachings and most unfortunately the prophetic advice that they are providing is wrong. Robert Fleming, an historicist, instructed King William III and Fleming was right on target. I wonder if the time will come again when the President of America or perhaps the Prime Minister of England will be instructed in the truth of the matter in true Bible prophecy so that he will know what he ought to do. I hope and many others hope to see that day come. Amen. David Steele wrote about the start dates of both 606 and 756. He wrote in 1870, but that was before the loss of temporal power. In his notes on the apocalypse, he says the following. All reliable expositors agree that the little horn is the papacy or the Romish church. This little horn is the special enemy of the saints of the Most High, and they are to be given into his hand. Daniel 7 verse 25. The first four trumpets subverted the Roman Empire in the West in the latter part of the 6th century. This event made way for the Bishop of Rome, in process of time, to acquire a great accession of ecclesiastical power. The civil and ecclesiastical rulers, equally unscrupulous and aspiring, were at this period on terms of comparative intimacy and occasionally disposed to reciprocate good offices. Focus, having waded through the blood of the citizens to supreme civil power, in order to secure his position, declared Boniface III, Bishop of Rome, head of the Universal Church. This impious act took place in the year 606. The Pope became also a temporal prince in 756. Now, we cannot know with certainty which of these events, nor indeed whether either of them, marks the period in time when the 1260 years began. Hence, we must remain at uncertainty as to the exact time when this most interesting period will end. Note the cautiousness of this historicist. He doesn't want to be too, dogma too dogmatic, but nevertheless, a great fulfillment was to take place later that year, bearing in mind that when he wrote this, it was the 1st of February, 1870. David Steele continues, Of all transactions recorded in history, however, that between Focus and Boniface appears most like giving the saints into the hand of the little horn. At this juncture in particular, church and state conspire, as never before, to resist the authority of Jesus Christ the Mediator. Paul's man of sin has been revealed in his time. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 6 Paganism has been abolished by formal edict throughout the Roman Empire and Christianity established as a recognized religion of the Commonwealth. Bishop Newton wrote in his dissertations on the prophecy 1754 this, First, the Exarchate of Ravenna, which of right belonged to the Greek emperors and which was the capital of their dominions in Italy, having revolted at the instigation of the Pope, was unjustly seized by Aestulfus, king of the Lombards, who thereupon thought of making himself master of Italy. The Pope, in this exigency, applied for help to Pippin, king of France, who marched into Italy, besieged the Lombards in Pavia, and forced him to surrender the Exarchate and other territories, which were not restored to the Greek emperor, as in justice they ought to have been, but at the solicitation of the Pope were given to St. Peter and his successors for a perpetual succession. Pope Zachary had acknowledged Pippin, usurper of the crown of France, as lawful sovereign, and now Pippin in his turn bestowed a principality which was another's properly upon Pope Stephen II, the successor of Zachary. In other words, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. The Pope had helped Pippin become king, and now Pippin is returning the favour. Uh, Bishop Newton goes on, and so, as Platina says, the name of the Exarchate which had continued from the time of Narsus to the taking of Ravenna by Aestulfus, 170 years was extinguished. This was effected in the year 755, according to Sigonius, and henceforward the popes, being now temporal princes, did no longer date their epistles and bulls by the years of the emperor's reign, but by the years of their own advancement to the papal chair. Elsewhere in the same book, Bishop Newton says this, it is confessed 
that the 70 weeks in the ninth chapter of Daniel are weeks of years, and consequently 1,260 days are 1,260 years. So long Antichrist or the little horn will continue, but from what time these 1,260 years is to be dated is not so easy to determine. It is seen that they are to be completed from the full establishment of the power of the Pope, and no less is implied in the expression given into his hand. Now the power of the Pope, as a horn or temporal prince, it hath been shown, was established in the 8th century, and 1,260 years from that time will lead us down to about the year of Christ 2000, or about the 6,000th and 6th year of the world, and there is an old tradition among Jews and Christians that, that at the end of the 6,000 years the Messiah shall come, and the world shall be renewed. The reign of the wicked one shall cease, and the reign of the saints upon the earth shall begin. But, as Irenaeus saith in a like case, it is surer and safer to wait for the completion of the prophecy than to conjecture and to divine about it. When, when the end shall come, then we shall know better whence to date the beginning. Now, as we saw before in a couple of, couple of earlier slides, Newton in 754 suggests the date of the temporal beginnings of the papacy at AD 755 as being the most significant starting date leading down to around the year 2000, or to be more precise, that would be 2015. But note his caution. And this is once again typical of these historicists who are looking forward in time. They are not throwing their everlasting all behind this and stating that this is the way it will be. And contrast this with the futurists who quite often throw all caution out of the window when they make their predictions, which always prove to be wrong, but it never seems to stop them selling the next book to gullible Christians. Here we have a quote from Adam Clark. I read with amusement how that some preterists claim that Adam Clark was one of them, uh, because he interpreted some passages of Daniel and the Revelation as they do. What the preterists conveniently admit to say is that he was on the historicist side of the fence, notwithstanding some points on which the preterists agree with him. In Adam Clark's 1810-1825 commentary on the Bible, he says this concerning Daniel uh, 7 verse 25. In prophetic language, a time signifies a year, and a prophetic year has a year for each day. Three years and a half, a day standing for a year, as in Daniel 9 verse 24, will amount to 1,260 years if we reckon 30 days to each month, as the Jews do. If we knew precisely when the papal power began to exert itself in the anti-Christian way, then we could at once fix the time of its destruction. The end is probably not very distant. It has already been grievously shaken by the French. In 1798, the French Republican army under General Berthier took possession of the city of Rome and entirely superseded the whole papal power. This was a deadly wound, though at present it appears to be healed, but it is but skinned over and a dreadful cicatrice remains. The Jesuits, not Jesus, are now the church's doctors. If the papal power as a horn or temporal power be intended here, which is most likely, and we know that that power was given in 755 to Pope Stephen II by Pepin, King of France, counting 1,260 years from that date, we are brought to AD 2015, about 190 years from the present. That is writing from AD 1825. But I neither lay stress upon nor draw conclusions from these dates. Once again, note the caution with which he speaks. This same caution is characteristic of historicist writers, as we have been seeing. Historicism is not given over to wild second coming date speculation. The enemies of historicism say that it is, but it's simply not true. Read the historicist books for yourself and you will not find it. In the case of 2015, we can clearly see that there is no fulfillment to point to. However, what I find interesting is how many of these older writers from two to three hundred years ago 
we're looking for some prophetic events to take place in our day. And this makes me wonder if we are on the cusp of something that we have not yet fully realized. For example, the 2016 Brexit vote, which I mentioned earlier, this may well create a domino, domino effect that completely destroys the European Union and with it, in some manner, completely destroy that great apostate, apostate anti-Christian power of the Church of Rome, as well as creating a terrible economic collapse that destroys economic Babylon, because Babylon is not only ecclesiastical, Babylon is also economic. Time will tell if this is the case. In Robert Fleming's book, The Rise and Fall of the Papacy, 1701, we read this. I believe this account of Antichrist's rise will not be very acceptable to some whose zeal for the Pope's downfall has made them entertain hope of living to see that remarkable time, which has made them invent plausible schemes to prove that this great enemy was seated in his regal dignity long before the year 606. But if man will trace truth impartially, he will have reason to think that the rise of this adversary could not be before that time. Nay, I must tell you that I do not reckon the full rise of the Pope to the headship of the Empire till at later date still. For though the Pope got the title of Universal Bishop at that time, yet he was afterwards for a long time subject in temporal concerns to the Emperors, and therefore I cannot reckon him to have been, in a proper and full sense, head of Rome, until he was so in a secular as well as in, a, in an ecclesiastical sense. And this was not until the days of Pippin, by whose consent he was made a secular, secular patrimony, so that as Boniface III and his successors, by assuming the title of universal bishop, was the forerunner of Antichrist, as Gregory the Great prophesied he would be, and who should be known in that world by that proud title. So, likewise, we may conclude that Antichrist was indeed come when Paul I became a temporal prince also. Focus, therefore, did only proclaim the Pope to be the last head of Rome in the apocalyptical sense, but it was Pippin who gave him the solemn investiture and seated him on his throne, which Charlemagne did afterwards confirm to him. Now, as near I can trace the time of this donation of Pippin, it was in or about the year 758, about the time of Pope Paul I began to build the Church of St. Peter and St. Paul. Now, if we make this the era of the Papal Kingdom, the 1260 years will not run out before the year 2018. According to the computation of the Julian years, but reducing these two prophetical ones, that would be years of 360 days, the expiration of the papal kingdom ends exactly in the year 2000, according to our vulgar reckoning, as if what I suggested above be true. Remember, Fleming is writing over 300 years ago and looking into the future, using the day for a year principle and, and anticipating that something dramatic might take place in what has become our day and age. For me, this is quite interesting, although as an historicist myself, I'm not prepared to make much of it at the moment. Robert Fleming says in the same book, supposing then that the Turkish monarchy should be totally destroyed between 1848 and 1900, we may justly assign 70 or 80 years longer to the end of the sixth seal and but 20 or 30 at most to the last. Now what's remarkable about this statement is that Fleming is writing in 1701 and he anticipated the Turkish Ottoman Empire to totally dry up between 1848 and 1900 and he was almost spot on. The Ottoman Empire had become known as the sick man of Europe and that phrase, the sick man of Europe, was a term first used in the mid-19th century to describe the Ottoman Empire. Now, it came to its practical end with its defeat at the end of World War I, and a few years later, in 1922, the Ottoman Sultanate was abolished and Turkey became a republic. If we add on the additional years Fleming suggests here, this takes us to the present time, our day and age, and a few years beyond this, and I find that this is quite interesting. 
Now, the rest of the quote from Robert Fleming, uh, I won't read out. It's shown here. You can pause the, uh, the slide here and read that as well as uh, on the next slide. This is the next slide. You can pause and read the, rem the remainder of Fleming's quote here. I'm not going to read this slide out, but here we have a snapshot from Moses Lohman's book, a paraphrase and note on the Revelation 1745. And you can see that he counts the expiration of the 1,260 years uh, as coming down to the year 2016. And again, in the same book by Moses Lohman, you can see that he's pointing to 2016 here. Again, I want to add that it is very important to note that I am not making a special deal of this year 2016 in relation to Bible prophecy and its connection to the Brexit vote. Time will tell if this year 2016 and the Brexit vote turns out to mark the closing era in the history of the modern European Union. Personally, I think it will but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it one way or the other. If it doesn't pan out this way, there's no problem. The main point of interest, at least it is to me, is that these early writers were looking down through the centuries to where we are today, and that is at least something worthwhile taking another look at. Supplementary to this section, I'm now going to read a few quotes from Roman Catholic writers which are relevant to this discussion of the 1260 year prophecy. Here we have a quote from Henry Edward Manning, a Roman Catholic cardinal uh, who was uh, the second Archbishop of Westminster from 1865 to 1892. And in his book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ, 1862, he says this, I say then that it was God's own act which liberated his vicar upon earth from subjection to temporal power, and that for 1,200 years the bishops of Rome have reigned as temporal princes. We're talking about a prophetic period of 1,260 years. Here, a great defender of the popes of Rome, of the papacy, of the Roman Catholic uh, faith, states that the history of the thing has seen that it was the Pope of Rome who reigned as a prince for 1,200 years. Surely this is beyond coincidence. Out of their own mouths, they confess to, that, to being that which is described in the prophecies. Manning goes on, they have possessed their own. No man has given to them their sovereign rights. They reign there as Christian princes by the providence of God. They are the first example of, Christian, of a Christian monarchy, the first seed of Christian Europe, the first role of Christian princes. Now, you and I couldn't possibly say those things without choking on the words, but let's not forget that, uh, forget rather that Manning is a great defender of the Church of Rome. Manning continues, what we call Christendom, and now for these 1200 years, the peace, the perpetuity and the fruitfulness of the Christian civilization of Europe has been owing solely in its principle of this consecration of the power and the authority of the great empire of Rome, taken up of old, perpetuated, preserved, and as I have said, by the salt which has been sprinkled from heaven and continued in the person of the supreme pontiff and in that order of Christian civilization of which he has been the creator. Again, out of their own mouths, they confess that they are but the continuation of the fourth world empire, the Roman Empire, but in a different form, an ecclesiastical form, exactly in accordance with the prophecies found in Daniel and the Revelation. Manning continues, the conversion of the empire to Christianity and then its removal its banishment into the Far East, freed the Vicar of Jesus Christ from temporal subjection, and then, by the action of the same providence, he was clothed with the prerogatives of a true and proper local sovereignty over that state and territory and people so committed to his charge. From that hour, which I might say was 1,500 years ago, or, to speak within limit, I will say was 1,200, the Supreme Pontiff has been a true and proper sovereign, 
exercising the prerogatives of royalty committed to him by the will of God over the people to whom he is father in all things both spiritual and temporal and once again it's plain to see out of their own mouths how well it fits in with the prophecy described in Daniel and the Revelation. In the book The Victories of Rome and the Temporal Monarchy of the Church, 1906, we read, It has prevailed de facto for more than 1,200 years and has been possessed de jure by divine natural law from the beginning of Christianity, although the first royal robes of our popes gleamed with the purple only of their own blood and Rome was their royal city, consecrato glorioso sanguine. In the same book we read, Constantine, by leaving Rome for his new capital in the 4th century AD 330, practically abandoned his position and power as ruler of Rome, together with the title of sovereign pontiff. But it was not until the end of the 6th century and the reign of St. Gregory the Great that the popes could reconcile themselves to the assumption of full power. This reluctance is recorded by all historians, and I've typed in there LOL in case you're wondering where that came from. The point of uh, what I'm showing here is that the Roman Catholics themselves uh, record the assumption of power about the end of the 6th century, and this brings this closely in line with historicists, which put it at the beginning of the 7th century, around the period 606 to 610 AD. In this Roman Catholic writing, the complete works of the Most Reverend John Hughes, Archbishop of New York, 1866, we read, Rome has been a government under the popes for some 1,200 years. And this brings me to an end of this whole segment dealing with symbols in prophecy and prophetic time measures. I'm now going to move on to a different part altogether.